Actually, can you try varying the frequency of anything? Yeah. So that's the LFO? That's the LFO. That's such a funny, like, <laughs> Hi, I'm Brenna Kennedy Moore, an electrical engineering student at MIT. This summer, I'll be working on a project exploring the cultural and electronic history of dub sirens, a unique and distinctive analog synthesizer born from Jamaican sound system culture. While a few schematics and DIY tutorials exist, the evolution and functionality of these instruments is surprisingly underdocumented. Over the next couple months, I'll be recording my process of building a dub siren step by step, working through each part of the circuit to understand how the highly technical and experimental world of Jamaican dub led to this influential and instantly recognizable sound. This project is part of MIT's Playful Audio Initiative. I'll be working with Philip Tan, a research scientist from the MIT Game Lab. He teaches a class on DJ history, and some of my circuits will be demonstrated in his class. To understand the dub siren, we have to first understand the Jamaican sound system culture. Can you tell us what's so unique about the music culture in Jamaica in the 1950s? So Jamaica has its own folk music traditions, mm -hmm. uh, popular genres such as mento, for instance, um, and also from other Caribbean islands such as Trinidad and Tobago, we've got calypso. But you've also got an audience who are familiar with American music. They can receive radio transmissions from America, mm -hmm. they can receive imports. American R&B, rhythm and blues and soul music. It's really popular. In the 50s, we got a lot of folks uh, returning after the war. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of talent like uh, Hedley Jones, for instance, who was an engineer for the RAF, mm -hmm. the British Air Force. He's a quite a prolific inventor. He built these um, sound systems uh, that uh, are designed not just for public address, mm -hmm. but for um, really, really loud, high quality reproduction of music. Mm -hmm. So this is coming sometimes even from decommissioned military gear that ended up in Jamaica and, and gets taken apart, put back together, repurposed for entertainment rather than for military use. Right, now record store owners really love this stuff because mm -hmm. um, it gave them a way to advertise what they had in store. You know, you mm -hmm. play your new records really, really loud um, and people within earshot will be able to hear it, maybe they'll come and buy some of those records or they might just show up to dance, mm -hmm. uh, which means they get hungry, they get thirsty and you can start selling them food and drink mm -hmm. and you start to have a little local economy built around these sound systems. Mm -hmm. This kind of uh, live advertising, street party culture that ends up uh, the term the people's radio becomes very relevant. And there's there's a lot of money in this and a, and a lot of naturally a lot of competition between these groups, between these different sound systems. So we have this kind of arms race of technical innovation that's happening between different sound systems. And at the same time, we have uh, the introduction of synthesizers and, and these these new sounds and, and the desire to kind of cut through a loud crowd and this loud bass. So how does that end up with dub sirens? Right, so remember in the late 50s and early 60s, electronic music is still uh, it's still new, it's still yeah. novel, right? Yeah. You know, um, maybe you've got TV shows like Doctor Who, for instance, and you have the theme song uh, <laughs> made by the BBC, but um, outside of maybe organs and amplified guitars and pianos, people mm -hmm. really haven't heard like transistor-based synthesizers. Yeah. So um, the ability to use different kinds and uh, of uh, sound effects to be able to grab uh, the audience's attention, mm -hmm. you know, gunshot sounds or you know police siren sounds, which mm -hmm. Are designed to be attention grabbing, yeah. um, start to find their ways into the sound systems and into the studios. Mm -hmm. But it's also being used in a musical context. It mm -hmm. will be affected like other music instruments in the studio with echoes, for instance, or uh, low pass filters. Mm -hmm. um, so you can think of it as a combination of an alarm and a sound effect and a synthesizer. Mm -hmm all at once. So we had this dub siren sound that was first heard in Jamaica and then it ends up in the UK as a standalone instrument. Can you walk me through how that happened? No one actually knows what was the first dub siren used in a sound clash or mm. in a sound system or in a studio. There are waves of immigration from Jamaica to the UK mm. um, after World War II. Um, UK is trying to rebuild itself, Jamaica is a British colony and there are jobs in the UK so people migrate with their families, with their records, with their sound their system culture. music and their culture. Exactly. Um, and uh, young folks in the UK get excited by all of this music that they've not heard before and start to participate in mm -hmm. this. 
is. Um, also, electronics start to become easier to manufacture, um, mm. better understood. We have things like the integrated circuit, you know, especially in the 70s. And the idea of taking this, what used to be a custom piece of hardware or a closely guarded secret and turning mm. it into a product that you could just sell yeah. and use in the studio or use in a sound, in a sound clash um, becomes much more feasible. Yeah. And we have this commercial product. We have uh, the NJD SE1 that was, that was sold independently as an instrument that exclusively makes these dub siren sounds. Right. Um, there are probably some users of devices like that in actual PA systems, you mm -hmm. know, or emergency broadcast systems. But the NJD SE1 is interesting because it allows you to adjust the range of the pitch warbling or mm -hmm. how fast it's going. Yeah. And you know, a police siren doesn't need to do yeah, that. There so, are performance parameters built into the built into the device. Exactly, it very much seems like it's meant to be played. Mm -hmm. There's this split in the schematics that I've been able to find between the transistor-based systems that are probably more accurate to what was originally happening in Jamaica, and then later in the 1970s or so, we have the 555 timer. So we have this integrated circuit chip that that starts replacing the transistor oscillators, and you can hear the sonic difference as the circuitry behind the instrument is evolving. Can you, can you walk us through the different eras of this sound and, and how it's changing? Right, so let's start with King Tubby, who is uh, uh, operating a studio in, uh, in Kingston. Mm -hmm. And now these are studio recordings, not live sound clash performances, but it's kind of indicative of the kind of sounds that you'd be able to hear even at a sound clash, right? Mm -hmm. So that's a very simple sound. It's almost certainly some sort of tuning tone, um, mm -hmm. maybe the kinds that you use with a guitars or in studio equipment. But you can hear there's a lot of effects already. Um, he's running them through what's probably a tape loop. Um, and then that echo effect is also uh, being um, affected with a filter. Mm -hmm. uh, so yes, yeah, it decays, you sort of get less and less high frequency. So it's already being used to creative effect. Mm -hmm. um, now, uh, if we go over to the 80s, I've got a track here from Aini Kamose, and um, you're going to hear something that's a little bit more sweepy. It's going to go through a range of different pitches. Now, you can build a circuit to make that sound specifically, but it's much more likely that someone was just turning a knob, mm -hmm. uh, manipulating some parameters while that sound was playing. So performing it, basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so this is kind of uh, the probably the NJD era, where you have just a transistor-based circuitry in the backbone, but you have these knobs that you can start playing. Right. It's a gradual sweep, mm -hmm. so it's not very rapid, uh, and it works with the sort of the dubby, echoey, low energy feel of mm -hmm. that reggae track. Um, finally, when we get into the 90s, uh, we hear a much more rapid um, uh, sound. Special request to all the gallon from North, South, East and West. From the body look good, I you know you have the God bless. Rock wide, rock the man's spine. Watch your line so that sound certainly is much more of a square wave oscillation. Mm -hmm. We are getting rapid oscillations between two very distinct pitches. Mm -hmm. um, and it's very difficult to do that. You can do it with transistors, but it's much easier to do that with integrated circuits like the NE555 timer circuit. Mm -hmm. um, and um, people associate those kinds of abrupt changes with digital audio, but you don't need digital audio to be able to make the yeah. sound. It's still analog. Yeah. That being said, now we are in the 90s, we have samplers that are starting to become accessible to a range of different music producers. And once mm -hmm. this record hits the stores and other music producers get their hands on it, they can sample it and they can use it on Just everywhere. <laughs> all kinds of music, UK yeah. music genres. But it's such a distinctive sound and you, and you can hear the lineage back to the Jamaican roots, even though there's decades between the, the tracks that are being made and, and the sounds and how they're being used. Right, you hear the Jamaican toasting right at the beginning. Mm -hmm. These music producers are very aware of the traditions that they're operating with. Yeah. At the heart of the dub siren is a pair of oscillators, a high frequency oscillator that creates the tone and a low frequency oscillator that shapes the changing parameters of the tone, creating the siren sound. 
What makes one design feel slow and smooth versus rapid and punchy usually comes down to which type of oscillators are used and how they are filtered. Here I have three different options of LFO circuits to control the audio output oscillator in our dub siren. Two are transistor based and the third uses a 555 timer. The audio oscillator in this setup is an NPN transistor based A-stable multivibrator, the same as this LFO except built for a higher frequency range. This is what the NPN LFO system sounds like. I'm using a potentiometer to change the rate of the low frequency oscillation. Our next option, which appears in most of the documented earlier dub siren schematics, is the PNP LFO transistor circuit. Our final option is a more modern circuit, which uses a 555 timer integrated circuit. You can hear a cleaner, more predictable sound using this LFO. Beyond the type of oscillators used, the sound of the dub siren is heavily influenced by how the output of the oscillators are filtered. In this setup, I've added filters to both the LFO and the audio oscillators. This is the filtered circuit. And for comparison, here is what the unfiltered circuit sounds like. In the next video, I'll be diving into the switch-based user interface of standalone dub sirens. We're still learning more, so if there's anything important that we missed or something you'd like more detail about, please let us know. If you're curious about building your own or just want to follow along, we plan to have all of the documentation listed on GitHub. Thank you to the MIT Voxel Lab and Wayne Marshall for their support and contribution to this project. Thanks for watching!